too sure what it is, but uh, afternoon. Uh, it's so good to be with you guys. My name is Craig Herbert. I am uh, the son of Marcus Herbert. Um, I'm on eldership at Cornerstone Church in Johannesburg. I uh, just wanted to say it's been an absolute privilege being with you. Uh, we came up on Wednesday. I spent some time with leaders, spent some time with uh, Mark and some other guys around here, and uh, spent some time with the elders, and I really... It's been great just to get to know you guys more and more. It's been an awesome time just to see what God is doing in Durban and God is doing through you guys. And uh, I was supposed to give you a bit of just my story and introduce my father, but I wanted you to just join worship. I, I want to just share a word with you guys if you don't mind. It's not going to be long, I promise. Um, although, just open your Bibles. No, I won't, uh, I won't do that. No, I'll leave the preaching to you. But um, it, I don't know if, if, it, if you've ever read the book of Joel. It's a very interesting book because it starts off with doom and gloom. It starts off seeming like the end of the world is happening. Uh, there's locusts that are described as armies that are uh, taking over. And then it shifts in about verse chapter 2. It's only three chapters. It's a, a wonderful book for me because it's, only, it's short and sweet and to the point. Um, and it shifts and it's sort of uh, Jesus starts or God uses uh, Joel to describe something of the, uh, the promise that we have in him. And uh, it's almost like there's this disaster unfolds, and then you know, God's going to redeem, the, the vats are going to overflow, there's going to be a harvest that is greater than everything, even though it's been destroyed. But there's this, this I read that, and I'm like, but how is this all going to happen? And uh, there's this amazing scripture in uh, chapter 3, verses 10, and it says this, it says, verse 9, it says, proclaim this among the nation, consecrate for word, war. Stir up the mighty men and women. Let all the men and women of war draw near. Let them come up. And then verse 10 says this. Beat your plowsheds into swords and your pruning hook into spears. Let the weak say, I am a warrior. I really just felt like that chapter, that, 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 that verse 10 is something of what God wants to do with this church. Is that describes taking normal mundane farming implements and turning them into weapons of war. I think it would be better to say, you know, let's consecrate for war, bring in the legions, bring in the, the chariots, bring in the, the men who could shoot bows and arrows with their right and left hands, bring in this massive army to overcome. But no, God wants to use ordinary, mundane, everyday people, and he just wants to blow spirit into them so they can declare war. Because uh, then it goes on and it says, uh, let the weak declare, I'm a warrior. You see, when God overcomes through the ordinary, no one else gets the glory but Him. And I feel like for you guys, God wants to just take your ordinary lives, and I don't, I don't say that disrespectfully, but your ordinary uh, mundane lives, whether it's a teacher, whether it's a nurse, or whatever you are, He wants to breathe His life into that, and He's going to take that, He's going to transform it into a place to declare His, His, His power and make His name known, and uh, that's how we're going to overcome. So I really just want to leave that with you guys, and um, you guys can, yeah, process that. Um, but anyway, yeah, my, I'm Craig. Like I said, we've been on eldership for 13 years uh, at Cornerstone, and uh, we've had the privilege uh, to come onto Tyrant's translocal team, the NCMI team. Um, and uh, about three years, four years ago, God spoke to myself and my wife and just told us to uh, start preparing for change. And uh, the word that God used for me was, he said, are you willing to do everything I ask you to do? To 100% obedience. And if you, if you or God say that, you're like, of course, God. I'll follow you. I've, I've accepted you as my Lord and Savior. I'll do anything for you. Then the very next thing was, uh, will you plant a church in New York for me? I was like, thanks, God. You gave me the terms and conditions first, and then you whipped in the, uh, the sort of what it means. So we went on a journey of just w uh, working with, uh, with the elders and, and working with the guys that we're accountable to as a church. And uh, we got to the place where we uh, yeah, had prepared our family and that, and we're in the process of transitioning into the States to plant a church in New York. It's been a, a, a long journey, um, if I can... You know, People ask me, what can you learn from this process? Don't try and move countries in the middle of a pandemic. It just seems to drag things on. Uh, so as things stand, as we uh, have our visas approved, everything's approved, we're ready to go, we sold our house, sold our car, everything's in storage, 
um, but the embassy is not open yet because of the pandemic, and uh, we're just waiting to go there to get the visa and then be on our way. Um, so that's a bit of, uh, in the interim, uh, waiting and being a cornerstone still and all of that, uh, we, I've had the privilege of being able to just travel with my dad a bit, uh, and that's why I'm here today. So um, uh, it's an absolute privilege, and I think something, you know, we speak about NCMI and we speak about a translocal team in that um, it's it really, it's what we see in Scripture. You know, Paul and Barnabas were sent out to go and minister to churches, and uh, through a relationship, you know, I remember my dad telling us as uh, elders, he said, I'm going to go see some scientist somewhere with a guy called Mark uh, Slaughter, and we were like, okay, that's great, like, who is this guy, we don't know, and next thing he rocks up at our elders meeting, and we're like, okay, cool, and we got to know him, he got to know us a bit, and it's a privilege to see that it's, 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 there's a partnering in the gospel, there's a partnering together to say, uh, he's been part of our elders meeting, and he's spoken to us and inspired us with what God's doing with you, and it's great to be able to be invited back to be able to do the exact same thing with you guys, to be able to sit here and say, you know, we can speak about whatever... Uh, whatever God's doing, but it comes down to are we partnering with men and women who believe the same thing, who are trusting God for the same thing, and therefore we can build God's kingdom. We don't want to fight over, over you know, stupid things. We want to actually partner with men and women who are trusting God for the name of Jesus to be lifted up and for His kingdom to be declared. And uh, that's why we find ourselves here. That's why we are uh, partnering and, and just blowing some wind into your guys' sails. And it's an absolute privilege to be here. So without further ado, I have to introduce my father, and um, I can probably tell you many things that, that, about him, um, which I won't. I can tell him the amazing father he is, or the uh, amazing granddad he is, but the one thing I want to tell you is he loves Jesus, and uh, that has been the one thing that I have tried to, there's other things, but the most important thing is to demonstrate a love of Jesus to my kids. Um, and I, I, I want to pray for us, you'll probably pray as well, but I want to pray that, that we open our hearts and we let Jesus impact us, that um, something of his kingdom will break through in our hearts as he, as he preaches and just opens up the word. Lord God, I pray that um, we don't look at the man, we don't look at the, the accolades and the success in, in, in church eyes and in man's eyes, Lord God, we look at the heart who just desperately wants to see Jesus revealed to everyone and his kingdom come. And we open our hearts as throughout worship there was a wooing, there was a, a awareness of what the Holy Spirit is doing in this meeting. And I pray that uh, the words that are declared today, the scriptures that are read, the, uh, the topic that is just unfolded will just be seeds that are planted in our hearts. That today we'll go away tonight and in the coming week and we will be uh, processing what it means to love Jesus more and what it means to declare his kingdom. Uh, that's what it comes down to. Change our hearts so we can become more effective in representing you, Christ. We love you, our King. Amen. Hello, Citygate. Good to see you again. I've had the privilege of uh, talking to you guys at the school. And now with that not happening, I... You never came back to the school. God's got another journey for you guys. But uh, I commend you as a church for getting back together. Were you quite excited about the change from 50 to 100? Okay, rebuke yourselves because it should have been 250. Really, I'm saying we need to get back. You know, we are practicing proper protocols. We really are doing that. I'm going to change things a little bit. Nikki, would you come here, please? That's your husband. Over there, and that's your seat. Now, I actually want you guys to come and stand. Put your Bibles in that down. Um, you know, it gets embarrassing, and I don't want to embarrass them, you know, when you go into context. And, you know, in our prayer today, uh, before the meeting, Vessi said, you know, I'm sure wherever you go, they always say, wow, it's great to have you. No. <laughs> Not always. But, you know, we obviously are recognizing God's gifts and praising God. Let's get that right. Um, today we're trusting God for a rich vein of deposit into our hearts. Think of that parable that Jesus taught right at the beginning about seed sown on hard rock, seed sown on sorry, shallow soil, 
seed sown into soil where there's competition going on uh, between weeds and the real thing that's happening. And then, of course, seed sown into good soil. So we know that all of Christianity is about a fight for truth. We've got, we, we can't just sit back and just be passive. It's a fight. The enemy is going to come like a bird and try and steal the truth. The enemy is going to come and try and choke it up with weeds. He's going to try and kind of cause rocks in our heart uh, where we don't value the word to kind of cause the seed to dry up when the sun comes out. Or we're going to fight for the right kind of hearts. And so I'm trusting God for that. This couple have devoted themselves to it in this local church. You know, they've taken up the call. And uh, when you read through kind of elders' responsibilities and, you know, the things that uh, they're going to be held accountable for, there's a lovely scripture. We read it to your leaders. <laughs> it says in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17, obey and submit to your leaders. That's, the leaders like that scripture. Then the next part of that verse says, for they watch over your souls. Isn't that amazing scripture, eh? You know, it keeps, when I meditate on, you know, and read that, it grips my heart. I've got a friend who's in Cape Town, he pastors a church, and whenever you, as a pastor, go to a wedding, they always put you at table number odd, you know, where all the unsafe family are, and you know, the less than normal people. You know, you're not quite sure what you're going to end up with. You know, the satanics, the rituals, whatever. And they always put you there, and they always tell me, you know, are we putting you there so you can get them saved? <laughs> they just don't know where to put you because you might embarrass some of their families. So anyway, this guy gets put on at one of those tables, and the boss and his wife are there of the couple, or of the man. And the boss is a very successful businessman, and so the question always comes up, so what do you do? So he asks the pastor, my buddy, and my pastor says, I look after another man's wife. Of course, that got his attention straight away. He said, explain. You know, he's thinking, is this guy a pimp or what is he? And he said, you know what? I look after the bride of Christ. Isn't that beautiful? I look after the bride of Christ. They devoted themselves with jobs and all the rest of it to focus on seeing the bride of Christ presented one day to the king without spot or blemish. That is a beautiful picture. I want to pray for them. I really want to. I know this is a difficult time for Mark. He, he obviously is wanting to be strong. This is his family is wanting to be here tonight. But let's just minister to them for a moment. Let's just trust God for... I, I, I feel this is not just healing for this moment. I really feel strongly in God and I'll explain some of it. This is definitely a new season for you guys. There's been a wonderful transition to become a church plant. Uh, and there's, I know last um, week you had an eldership couple leave, uh, but now your new season is here. And it's a season to build and wisdom. And, and I, I just love listening to uh, Mark when we phone each other, the, the thoughts, the, the heart of wanting to see things happen. And now I'm praying for his spirit for his wisdom, for his anointing. Thank you, Lord, for this amazing couple, for their dedication to you, for their desire to want to see this church flourish, Father. Thank you that they watch over the souls of those that are here. And we pray and stand around them and say, right now in the name of Jesus, would you comfort them, would you strengthen them, would you let them know the grace of God. Just a wonderful grace package of love to surround them. And then, Lord, wisdom, insight, as they wait on you for the way forward. And I do know, Father, that this isn't going to be same old. There's a plan you have. There's ingenuity. There's, uh, Lord, all kinds of strategy that you're going to work out. But ultimately, a believing group is going to be raised up with this focus on the gospel to impact the city and beyond so we commit them to you and we thank you for them. Resource them, Lord. Be with them in Jesus' name. Amen. Appreciate you guys. We really do. You know, we, we uh, have an, I have another favorite scripture in Hebrews 13, verse 7. It says, remember your leaders. Remember them. 
And I want to encourage you with that. Remember your leaders. You know, often we access leaders when there are issues. And then when we've overcome or, you know, kind of the road ahead looks clearer, we forget about them. So remember, just remember, don't forget. Pray for them. The rest, I always say, bake them a chocolate cake or wash their car. Is that okay? Now, he pays me to do a lot of this stuff. So, uh, so God, for me, in the seasons that are coming, um, Mark and the eldership team and the leaders over here, he's setting you guys up for occupation and advancement. Um, you know, we win the war. You're, if you study warfare in that, when we keep the ground we've taken, we take new ground. And, you know, often in our frustration as believers, it's like we take one step forward and then a half a step back, or two steps forward and one step back. And it just seems frustrating. But this group of people, and I do believe every local church, but this season you're coming into, it's to keep what God has given you. He's made you city gate people for this area, for, for Durban. Just about to say Joburg. And he has you there for a reason. And, and occupy. Occupy means pray over. Own that ground spiritually. Joshua had to go and stand there, and he had to say, God told him, every place on which your foot shall tread, I've given to you. And so we have that attitude. This city belongs to Jesus Christ. This is his city. He has us here for this reason. And as long as I've got breath, I'm going to have faith on the stage, and I am going to trust God for revival in the city. Durban needs a revival. Durban is heading for a revival. Durban is going to see a revival, and I'm sure every one of us sitting up here is saying, it needs to be in our lifetime, Lord. We want to see that. We want to see the throngs of people turn, and the stadiums that have gone up for entertainment and sport are going to be for the gathering of the saints. Not special events, but that's how big we're going to need our venues to be to accommodate what God wants to do. God moves by the power of His Spirit in Jerusalem. 3,000 people added. Daily people are added. A little while later, 5,000 men, it says. We're not too sure if that meant, you know, just it was a men's meeting only. Or, you know, I think it was 10,000 at least were saved. And so eventually that Jerusalem church impacted to the tune of 25 to 30,000 people in a matter of months. It was like a quarter of the city had turned to Jesus Christ. Do that again, Lord. Do it in Durban. That's occupy. Remember Christ, when he left, he said to us, occupy, occupy. In other words, take ownership. We're not yet to apologize for being alive and being Christians. No, we occupy. We occupy with our prayers. We occupy with our opinion. Our opinion is there's a better way to live to the citizens of the city. There's a much better way to conduct ourselves. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we trust in Him for it. And wherever we have the chance, we lead people to Jesus. So that's here. The second way is we take new ground. You win the war when you keep the ground you have and you take new ground. And so already we pray as a church, what are the doors, Lord? Which are the doors you want in us to walk through? Do you want us to go to northern KZN? Do you want us to go to the Midlands? Do you want us to go to Gauteng? That's like a real missionary trip. You need all kinds of courage and weaponry and what, whatever to kind of... And you'll need shoes. Uh, <laughs> to you Durban guys. Um, you, you know, where do you want us? We, as a little church in Bedford View, in Johannesburg... We can list about 30 doors God's given us as we prayed and trusted Him. Yesterday, we were 38 years old as a local church. And thank God for, this, for, for the simplicity of our approach and our desire to want to take this gospel out. Do we sit with a, a room full of pioneers and you know, guys with you know, great ability and girls with incredible wisdom and the rest? No, normal, ordinary people doing extraordinary things with a heart of obedience. So I do believe this Occupy and this next aspect of our prayer and expectation of faith and the rest of it for this local church is we want to take new ground, Lord. We don't want to perfect this and then go. When do you go? When do you launch out? When we have the right budget, 
when we have the right number of people, when we've got a building. Now we are a real church. Now you were a real church the minute two or three of you got together. That's it. But it's not when those things happen, it's our hearts are ready to go further. And so I want to just back up a little bit and go through the book of Matthew. And you think, oh God, here we go. It's Friday, what is it, Sunday? I've even forgotten. And I'll be a little tired. 28 chapters in Matthew. I'm going to look at three instances where it talks about my, my preach this afternoon is called, um, uh, let me get the title right, <laughs> Made, Called, and Commissioned. The three kind of steps of a discipleship in my understanding. The three times when Jesus calls the disciples, commissions the disciples, and challenges them. And for, it applies to every single one of us. What Christ did there, He's doing with us. We see it in the life of Paul. We see it in the teaching of Scripture. We are called to be disciples. And with that comes the responsibility of being the army of God. God is not going to choose another people. He's choosing us to fulfill what He's called us to do. So second to that, um, I, I just want you to make this I just sense it's a time for, for healing and for restoration. I feel one of the hallmarks and characteristics of this church is people are going to be able to come here and get healed in every way, not just, you know, emotionally is what we normally think, but I feel physically and, you know, in, a, in their personalities. I tell you, the world is cruel. The world hammers people. The world puts us down and no, the world, you know, I am 7143662OBT. That's my army number. 5506255107089. That's my ID number. 4035142627, my bank account number. That one is not important. You want my password? <laughs> Numbers. We are not important. We are, we are just kind of, you know, entities out there. But in God's kingdom, we are in incredibly valuable and precious. And, and that's what we come into. We save into family. And, and, you know, the discipleship process is showing us the incredible value we are in, in the kingdom of God and created and called. We have a purpose as well. And so I want to encourage us with that this morning, this afternoon. Um, one of the statements that gets, keep getting made by the guy who leads the NCMI, Tyron Daniel, the world at its worst needs the church at its best. And so as the systems fail and we spiral downwards, we, the church, are the anchor. We, the lighthouse. We, that place they're going to run to. And people need restoration and healing. And you guys are going to show some of us some of that because I feel it's a, a strong kind of hallmark of what your ministry is going to entail. Uh, your ability to restore. Think of how many folk are casualties of bad marriages and abusive situations. Uh, you, know, you know this issue of uh, psychosomatic and, and mental illnesses, and that is horrific. But in Christ, we're able to find a place of healing. God's going to use you guys for that. Turn with me to Habakkuk 2.14. Many of you will know Habakkuk for though the fig tree doesn't blossom, and uh, there'd be no calf in the stall. You know, in other words, the circumstances of this world and the economic indicators are going down. It says in Habakkuk, yet will I rejoice in the Lord. In other words, it doesn't matter. I'm, my joy is not tied into the world and its systems. But here's a wonderful verse in Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth will be filled or covered with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's what we're working towards. We're not working towards City Gate being successful, NCMI being powerful, uh, you know, or whatever. We are working towards the glory of God filling the earth. We trust in Him for that. We want to link in with anybody who has a vision and a passion for the same thing. And we want that to be what they see when they see the church. You know, COVID really did reveal where the church was weak and it revealed where the church needs to get stronger and it did show us some of the areas that we're building in that are, are good. And so 
the, the relational side of things, if you as a church weren't established on biblical relationships, if you as an individual were not tied into a local church with relationships, this COVID time was a real test. It really was. And I know some churches had no clue who belonged to them, uh, you know, who was part of them, where the church was, were the people still there, weren't they there, because they had no relationships. My simplest and purest understanding of Christianity, it's about relationships. We belong to one God, and we are connected to each other through the blood of Christ. And that's awesome. But I tell you, local church doesn't seem to often reflect that. Because we feel like relationship is attendance or association with the group of people coming to a meeting. No ways. Relationships is far more. We've got to scratch beneath that surface. We've got to get to know each other. So those churches that weren't built relationally battled. Churches that were built relationally, we were one like that. We realized our relationships are very thin, and we needed to strengthen those. And I feel this thing of discipleship is something that God's got His finger on right now. You know, we've, uh, Mark and I have been chatting. We've inspired each other with our own thoughts, and obviously the Scriptures and some of the books that we've read. And I, I just want to talk to us about discipleship with this. Turn with me to um, Matthew chapter 4, please. So the challenge with these relationships, I want to ask you, are you integrated and functioning in this local church? And if you are, then help others around you to be integrated and functioning. And it's a priesthood job for us to help folk. I remember kind of being radically saved out of a drug culture, you know, where your whole kind of way of life, your thoughts, the language you spoke, coming from the bluff, our language wasn't the choicest, uh, and kind of now getting saved into a church where everybody wore crimpoline and, you know, very bad clothing. If you want to know what's in fashion 20 years ago, go to a church, you know what I mean? It, it was like crazy. I thought I'd, I was like a Martian on earth compared to what was going on. I never, this brother, you know, hello brother. I said, I'm not your brother. I'm really, I'm not. I don't want to be your brother. <laughs> you know, it's the Christianese, the, all these terms. Okay, further than that, of course, the word of God, worship, you know, how to conduct yourself. For the first six months, one of the guys in the church realized this guy, if he's not discipled, he's going to be out of here very soon. He could see it. And I had this guy. It wasn't a program. It was an interest. It was a love. It was a relationship. He walked with me for six years. He didn't give me a Bible reading program. He said, sit down. I'm going to show you how I read the Bible. I was just blown away. And I said, wait, hang on. I want to take notes. And then he said, I'm going to show you how I study, how I pray. I'm going to take you to my home group. And he took me to his home group. And then he realized, don't leave this guy for a day. So every day of the week I had a home group and a prayer meeting and a Bible study and, and the rest. And on my day off, he said, you know what I'm going to do? Is I'm going to show you how to witness, how to do outreach. So we went and bought tracts at Scripture Gift Mission. And then at Colton Center, every Saturday I used to cruise. Cruise the different floors, the ice rink at the bottom, all the cafes. Eventually the guards used to say, listen, be kind to the people today. I used to clock them. If they weren't Pentecostal Christians, they were all going to hell. The Methodists were going to hell. The Baptists were going to hell. You know, I confronted people with the gospel. And look, he, what he put was very good foundations into my life. And God tempered a lot of that attitude and, you know, showed me the importance of love and so on. Um, but I had somebody that walked with me. And so I want to encourage every one of us, don't just assume because you're integrated and you're functioning part of the body of Christ, that's cool. We must keep our eyes open. Because as people come in, for you to invite them to walk with you for a season, without it being a program, that is discipleship. And then on top of that, you have more formal discipleship. As you're invited to kind of function in a certain way or get exposed to some of the truth of God's Word, it's vital. But God wants us 
every single one of us to be discipled and to disciple. And the frustrating part of Christianity is it becomes a spectator sport and consumerism when there's no discipleship. You see, when it's always just all about me, I arrive here and I say, well, what is this church going to do for me? May Day. That's the distress call. Crash and burn is coming very soon. The way we grow is to give in the kingdom of God. The way we are blessed is to bless others. The way we receive grace is to give grace. And so I want to look to impact, to connect, to love, and, and to encourage others. This world is lonely. People are incredibly lonely. Millions of people together in a city, but they are lonely. We need to connect. We use our lives and our homes for that. So first time Jesus talks about discipleship is um, Matthew 4. Verse 18, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Immediately, underline it, they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James and the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them immediately, underline it, they left the boat and their father and followed him. That's the starting point of discipleship. We are all in this church because we've become followers of Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus. He's a follower of Jesus. Follower. We're all followers of Jesus, and we're in a process of being made. Discipleship is we are being made. Like a potter has clay, he's making that clay into something. And so discipleship is following Christ. And the way we follow Christ is we understand His Word. We worship. We connect. We fellowship. We build community. We encourage each other on. That's the whole process. That's local church. The called out ones, in other words, those who are born again and have become followers of Jesus, we're working together. As iron sharpens iron, I irritate him. He irritates me. We learn to love. You can't just sit there alone and say, I love. No, it's only when we are challenged. Now I've got to learn to love you. Even though you're ugly and I'm ugly, we've got to find a way to love. You know, it's amazing how naive we are. We really are. It's like these stages you've got to go through. First stage when we meet somebody is we love them like even more than Jesus. You know, like we're super sweet and super kind to them. And as soon as we fall out, you know, we scratch and then we see the veneer beneath the, uh, uh, we see the wood beneath the veneer, we fall out. No, love says now, even though I can see warts and bumps, I love you. I'm choosing to love you. We've got to mature in our love. And so we need each other. So you're a follower of Christ, I'm a follower of Christ, and we are being made. The potter has got this lump of clay, and he's going to put us through processes because he's busy making something. But what is he making? And the majority of church does this kind of thing. We preach that he's making us comfortable. He, he's, you know, it's all about me. Church is all about you. We're so glad you came today, really. And I'm, I want to apologize for the plastic chair. We'll do our level best because we want to compete with the church down the road that has got cinema seating. How was your experience today? Did it kind of, uh, we've got a suggestion box, Vessi, and if you've got anything you could tell us about how we could improve, we'd love to do that. There, there is some truth about making your experience good. But this is not about you. This is about learning how to worship Him. And so Jesus said, I'll make you fishers of men. So just realize right now, every one of us has been discipled by Jesus using local church and leaders and everything that goes on to make you a fisher of men. So wherever you are, He's wanting to make you a fisher of men. That's it, simple. The river that flows from the throne of God, we see it in Ezekiel 47, it says... That river is the gospel that flows to the Dead Sea, which is the world and its systems. And where that water hits, the gospel hits, that water comes alive. And in that river where there's life, there fish, and it's a place to spread our nets. We've turned Christianity in. You get saved, and your whole duty to fill a seat and pay your tithes and shush. Don't phone me. 
Not on a Monday, but we're off. So, you know, it's that kind of attitude. That's rubbish. No, we are mobilized to go make a difference. Within weeks of knowing the disciples, he's sending them out. So God is not about let's perfect you, then send you out. No. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you're a fisher of men. Isn't that awesome? So if you have any doubt about what we are called to or what the discipleship process is, the discipleship process is not to make you good citizens of heaven. I've heard that. Good citizens of South Africa. I've heard that. You know, comply. I've heard that. It's to make you a fisher of men. That practical element is almost missing in our expression of Christianity. So then we go to the next time he calls. So that call is for every one of us. It's all the same. The big thing is, will you work with Jesus? You know, and I, I know there is a scripture about the clay saying to the one who's kind of making whatever he's making, you know, I don't want to do this. And I think a lot of times we frustrate what God's doing because you're choosing comfort. I'm choosing, you know, this is Christianity is about me being famous. And we've got all these motives. But he's saying, put those all down and let me make you. And we don't have to worry. We don't have to think, oh, I'm going to have to speak to people and I hate speaking to people. Just chill. Let him make you. And before you know it, you'll be leading people to Jesus. Next one is Matthew chapter 10. Verse 1, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. That's a specific call. So discipleship is we generally, every one of us are going to become fishers of men. So we are being made by Jesus into fishers of men. And I tell you, the more we become like Jesus, the more we'll want to see people saved. Okay? But now, that group of 12, out of all the disciples that there were, were called specifically to be apostles. You go to 1 Corinthians 12, some apostles, some prophets, some speak in tongues, some do this, some admin. You go to Romans chapter 12, if your gift is leadership, lead. If your gift is giving, give. If your gift is mercy, show mercy. In other words, every single part of the body has got a godly function. You cannot say to me, I've been called to be a, a, a kind of trophy in God's chest, a, a, a trophy cabinet. Not at all. None of us have been called to be on show, you know, just to be polished up on a Sunday, and then that's it. Every single one of us has been made with a purpose. Before you were in the womb, the Bible tells us that he knew you. And he said, you know what? Mark. And then he made him with that personality, with that set of gifts, with that purpose in mind. And discipleship is finding that purpose. So I remember um, getting my mom and dad's Bible from when they were married. And a nice King James, and I read it, you know, from the minister, uh, you know, Mr. and Mrs., you, we congratulate you on the, your wedding and the rest of it, and the date. And then I read the date, and I checked my birthday. And I thought, I was a miracle. <laughs> I, for th three months, I must have been in an incubator. Because I was born six months after they got married. I phoned my mom, and I said, wow, I'm a miracle. You know, how was it? How big was it? Like a few inches big? You know, you know that kind of thing. And she says, no. <laughs> you were unexpected. <laughs> you were not planned. You know, this was a thing that your dad and I got, got up to on a Chevy 57 in the back seat at a driving. You know, sorry about that. You know, I wasn't planned for them. For God? Highway. No, no. He planned me. He knew that that might be the set of circumstances and I could say, oh, well, I was just a mistake and, you know, God never knew me and all the rest. Get over that. Get over it, really. I'm telling you, none of us are a mistake. God knew that that would happen to me and in a specific, beautiful, loving and understanding way, He planned my salvation and He planned me with a purpose. He said, I'm calling you to this. And that's what we want to do in local church is let's find out what we should do. Every single part of the body has a function. 
So he's going to show it to you. There's no way God's going to make you without showing you what it is. Guess what? He's going to give you the gifts. He's going to open the doors as you seek him. And it's always going to have something to do with the gospel. You know, often we think our call is to be engineers or nurses or whatever. Not at all. Our call, when it comes to kingdom of God, our call has always got something to do with the gospel. There's some unique function. You, you might be able to reach that set of people, encourage that set of people, help those people rehabilitate. With my drug background, I'm able to identify with druggies and show them that with Christ you can overcome. You're going to have more patience with certain people. You're going to have a disposition and a personality to suit it, have something to do with the gospel. Faithful with a little, then he'll give you more spheres of opportunity. I always say it's, this, this is the illustration. Paul died and went to heaven. The Lord never said to him, well done, good and faithful tent maker. Paul, I really loved the way you did tents. I loved your stitching. I loved the way you added rooms on and you stretched the tent curtain wide. I loved the way you dyed leather. He never. He said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. And according to the gifting, the talents, he gets his reward. We will all get a reward. The tent making, that was his craft, was a platform for the gospel. Your, your career is a platform for the gospel. Even us who are called to church paid ministry or full-time ministry, our, that is a platform for the gospel. Nursing, platform for the gospel. Doctor, platform for the gospel. Um, surfer, another, we'd go move on. <laughs> <laughs> platform for the gospel. Whatever it is, it's a platform. And so you can stand on that and the opportunities it gives you in that boardroom is reach out with the gospel. But our job is the gospel. And then as you're faithful with a little, you be faithful with much. And then when that day comes, the great white throne judgment, we stand before the Lord. Can you imagine all of creation, all of heaven, gathered there, crushed on the throne, and the Lord says, Mark, Anthony, Slaughter. Now, what's your second name? <laughs> Nicholas. Mark, Nicholas, Slaughter. And he walks up. I tell you, that will be terrifying. But because we were judged in Christ, he says, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into your rest. Wow. I, I, that's enough for me. But in his love, there'll be a reward. I do not know how to equate that. You know, some say it's cities, it's responsibility, it's blessing. Some say you're going to shine brighter than others. I don't know what it is. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm into the shining one <laughs> more than anything. It's, it's amazing. You'll judge angels, whatever. So maybe some of us will judge more angels. I'll have all the little ones to judge. <laughs> You'll have the big ones, you know. All the ladies and the aunties and the grannies that prayed for us, they'll have the reward. We'll have the house in their room, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's amazing. How it's going to work. But he'll do it. And you see, local church and leadership and the discipleship process is to help us get that. Isn't God beautiful? Before I was born, he knew who I'd be. He put that personality in me. He gave me a job to do. And he set me up for a reward. And he said, now Christ is building his church. So commit yourself. Get involved. The discipleship process is to help us with that and achieve what God's called us to. And you know what we choose to do is just to sit, do nothing, and achieve nothing, and I'm not going to follow the processes. No. Let's reverse that. Priesthood of all believers. Last one is Matthew 28. You knew this was coming. It says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and behold, I'm with you even or always until the end of the age. Isn't that a powerful scripture? So Christ leads us. He leads us. Tells us, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. I'm giving you a specific call. And in your togetherness, I'm calling you to disciple the nations. So in other words, your ability to disciple here is going to find greater expression as you pioneer this heart, this DNA, into the nations. You're going to go and show people who speak a different language what a disciple of Jesus is. We weren't called to go and tickle them with the gospel, hand out tracts, put up Jesus posters or whatever. We were called to go and get them saved and to show them how to live. 
And, and so this discipleship process is a call that's on every one of us. This discipleship necessity, this gospel's got to go out. It's the thing we are going to do together. Uh, I said to a previous group of people, you know the, uh, the musician Carmen? Do you remember him? Any of you remember Carmen? The older guys. He used to sing very dramatic songs. But he has one where Moses slams his staff down in heaven. And he says, tonight is testimony night. <laughs> then we are going to share the stories of the privilege through our relationships and discipleship processes. We partner together and we broke open new territory for the gospel. That's local church. Our picture of local church is this dead, boring, mediocre, lukewarm bunch of people just hanging on until Jesus comes back again is not a biblical one. God has called us to be a mobilized people and to take hold of the nations and to trust Him that here are the pioneers. Here are the nation changers. You know, we look around us and you say, well, good luck with you, buddy. I can't see any of them. Yeah, there are you. In the flesh, no. In the spirit, yes. Because as He anoints, we can do those extraordinary supernatural things. And so together, we're waiting on Him. Which nations, Lord? Where do you want us to go? We want to celebrate those church plants, those trips to other areas where we can encourage churches. That's the nature of the church. And so we've definitely got a job to do in occupying because we want to show that there's a, an understanding of Christianity that by and large we got it wrong. We've made it about comfort. We've made it about the accumulation of wealth and knowledge and, you know, getting involved with politics and all that rubbish. Rubbish. We've got a message, Jesus. We've got an understanding, kingdom. And we've been called to do it together. So those relationships and through those discipleship processes, we, we develop this partnership understanding that we are now called to go and make a difference. So when somebody stands up here and they give their testimony and they say, God's calling us to plant it's not, well, good luck, buddy. You know, hope it works out. It's not, how do we get behind it? We're a base church. We want to pour our finances. We want to say, is it my turn to join? I, I want to join. I want to go. Where, where are you guys going? Um, where, sorry, I never heard that. Mongolia, not my turn to join. You know, it's, I remember very clearly, we used to run church plants as training for NCMI at Cornerstone. And one year, a couple from the Eastern Cape arrived, and we asked where they're going to, and they said Mongolia. The whole church just sighed. Thank God for that. We don't have to go there now. <laughs> that's one you can tick off. That's an awkward one. But it's wherever we want to get behind it. We want to pray for it. We want to resource it. And we're not going to sit there and say, oh, you know, this is like taking away from the church. No, you can't. This is why the church exists. So I want to be part of it. I really do. I want us all to be part of it. But I tell you, who disciples the nations? Who? Let's go right back to Matthew chapter 4. Fishers of men. If you're not a fisher of men, you are not going to disciple the nations. Then discipling the nations, planting churches, and that is going to be a program this church does and a few people get involved with. But if we are fishers of men, we are going to want to see the nation's disciple. So I want to pray for that boldness. I want to pray for that courage. I want to pray for that mind shift. I want to pray for that understanding. Go through those three incidents. Follow Jesus. Become fishers of men. Called to a specific task. Thirdly, in our togetherness, we are being commissioned to go and make disciples. Isn't that amazing? You know, it's, it's, he didn't say that to a Bible college. He said it to local church. Let's pray together. Let's trust God together. If you kind of feel like in your heart something is stirring, I want to pray. Because I do feel God's commissioning in all ways. Fishers of men and the nations. But if you feel like God's got hold of something, He's restored something, He's teaching you something, He's challenging you with something, there are some changes that need to be made. I want to take responsibility. Please stand. Please stand. Because I want to trust God with you as I pray for all of us. For these workings of the Spirit in your heart. I'll give you an opportunity to stand up.
And I do feel, and I use that illustration of my life and uh, the fact that I was premature <laughs> to show that none of us are mistakes. If somebody has told you that, please, I just want to, I want to counter that and say, you're a, you're a valuable and precious, incredibly beautiful asset in the kingdom of God. And, and you're not a mistake. It's not like, well, there's all these other great, wonderful people and I'm one of the others. No. No, 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 no. You, his first thought. You weren't his last thought. You, his first thought. So, Father, firstly, I just want to thank you for the guys and girls that are standing. Thank you for their hearts that are responding to you. And, and we just want to identify the fact that That you, you are challenging, you are, by the power of your spirit, enabling, you help you make changes. I know there's hurts from previous leaderships, perhaps involvement in a church where I may have been abused or misused or not appreciated. Let him, let him handle that. Let him take that away. Let him just be the healer. And now we trust you wisdom, for the insight, for the anointing, to be able to be the disciples you've called us to be. Fishers of men, doing the thing you've called us to do, discipling the nations. That's discipleship. We know discipleship is not a self-betterment program, Lord. And so, with, in the intimacy of those hearts, we know you, it's deep calling to deep. There's something going on of a restoring and a healing and then of a commissioning. Thank you for commissioning right now. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to use every single one of us. And we trust you for those especially that are standing to make a difference. Fishers are men. Fishers are those that need to know you as Lord and Savior. Thank you that you're impacting right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. And I do know that out of this group, we're going to hear about church planters. We're going to hear about people wanting to give their lives to another people group so that they might know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Businessmen like Philip, who went to another town and preached the gospel and saw amazing signs, wonders, and miracles. We trust you for that, Father. We trust you in the name of Jesus. And then to every person sitting here, pray that you'd help us accomplish those things you've called us to. That our faith would go beyond attendance and a consumer mentality to where we mobilized and we realized the importance of reaching out with the love of Jesus. God is definitely healing you today. There's like a depth that He's working into our lives and a sensitivity to flow with the Holy Spirit to be sensitive it, it says in the Great Commission and I will be with you until the end how? by the power of His Holy Spirit so as we flow in the Great Commission there's a great anointing that accompanies the Great Commission and so Thank you that you're doing that in lives here now. As you heal us, you call us to heal others and to minister your grace to them. Thank you, Father. So commission us. We trust you that we would be practical to pray for those who need to be saved around us and to look for opportunities and to open our hearts to what you've called us to and to go, wherever it may be. Pray for that, Father. Commission, commission every single person. What have you called me to do, Lord, when it comes to the gospel? What, Lord? What? I want to know. And that's where our leaders help us. But of course, we ask our King and He shows us. Thank you, Father.
motivation behind all of this is love. It's a great love of God to you right now. You can sense the love of God almost tangibly. I, I, I just feel that issue of you minimizing your value to God and the kingdom is something He's dealing with right now. His love is compelling you. His love is showing you that you are valuable, you are precious. You're not the byproduct of anything. You're not kind of something second class. So touch now, Lord, every single one of us with your love. You're an awesome king. You're an awesome king.